Hello everyone, here in Think a Bit, we have started a new series on literary theory and we will be starting our journey with structuralism. Now you might have come to this video with some prior knowledge of structuralism. You might have watched a lot of YouTube videos on this topic, you might have read one or two books, but there is still a high possibility that many of the things that you know about structuralism are absolutely wrong. Let us put that to a test. Do you agree with me when I say that the spoken word pen is a sign consisting of a signifier which is the phonetic component or the sound pen and a signified which is the concept of the pen and not this actual pen that I have in my hand? If your answer is yes, then you definitely need to watch this video. As for the signified part, when you say that it is the concept and not the actual object, you're absolutely right. But in the case of the signifier, most of the students believe that it is the sound or phonetic component or the material part of the sign, which is clearly wrong. The Sasurian model of the sign is psychological in nature. For Sasur, as you will find in the course in general linguistics, both the signifier and the signified are purely psychological. They are immaterial, which means they cannot be heard, seen, touched, smelled or tasted. So, the signifier is not the material sound as Sasur himself has clarified multiple times in the course but the psychological imprint of that sound. It is the impression that the sound makes on our senses. I will elaborate on this topic, do not worry. Now there is a catch to it. For the post sasurians the signifier does mean the material part of the sign, which is in this case the sound or the phonetic component. And it happened particularly after the Danish linguist Louis Emsley entered the scene and reworked some of Saussure's original ideas. However, you cannot apply post Saussurean terminology to explain Saussure's model. Even if you do so forcefully, you will decontextualize the whole thing and problematize it even further, making a mess out of it. I will come back to this point later on. However, in order to prove me wrong, you might pick up a book like this one by Professor P. K. Nair and you might refer to this portion on page 6 where Professor Nair has clearly stated that the signifier is the sound or the phonetic component. Hmm. In this particular book, the entire section on the sign system has many such problematic statements. For example, on page 5, Professor Nair has equated the signified with the meaning. Now, this is again a very problematic statement because meaning is tied to the context. It is a social product. Meaning depends on extra-linguistic factors, factors that exist outside the linguistic sign. However, my intention is not to disrespect Professor Nair in any way. In fact, I have always been an admirer. I just loved his pop culture references and I believe that he is the one who has made theory interesting for Indian students. And this particular book, I would say, is still a very good option for a beginner if we avoid his problematic take on the science system. However, the list of common misconceptions among students does not end here. Throughout this video, along with our normal discussion on the science system, I will be addressing these misconceptions one after another. Now, because I'm trying to dismantle this entire structure of misconceptions, I'll be citing from some of these books in order to consolidate my points. Structuralism and Semiotics by Terence Hawkes. 
semiotics by daniel chandler introduction to structuralism by michael lane and finally the most important of all the course itself by sir okay let us start our discussion on structuralism structuralism is a transdisciplinary academic perspective it is a mode of thought common not just to the social sciences like anthropology politics sociology psychology economics but also to the humanities like literature and history the structuralist stances that emerged out of disciplines as diverse as these are collectively known as structuralism now structuralism has such a wide scope because it seeks to explain all human social phenomena the basic premise of structuralism is that all manifestations of social activities constitute languages right from our fashion the sports that we play recipes to the systems of kinship and marriage everything is structured like a language the regularities in these systems can be reduced to the same set of abstract rules and regulations that govern natural languages it roughly means that we can extract a proper vocabulary syntax and grammar out of these systems as well let's take the game of cricket for example in cricket we have proper cricketing terms like no ball free hit umpires bowlers etc in cricket we have proper cricketing rules which form the grammar of cricket as for the syntax the ordering process initially happens through the toss the toss determines which team would bowl first and which team would bat first during the game the batting side follows a proper batting order and the captain of the bowling side takes the call which bowler he wants to go with at different stages of the game now i know this is an oversimplified explanation of cricket as a semiotic system but i hope i have driven my point home i will talk about the basic tenets of structuralism however i have reserved that discussion for my last video on this topic for now let us try to locate the starting point of structuralism the term structuralism was coined by roman jacobson in the year 1929 but structuralism primarily began with ferdinand de saussure tiran sox however in his book has traced the origin of structuralism in the work of jean baptiste vico vico in his book the new science talks about mankind's inherent ability to structure the world around him and making himself a subject of his own structure now there is an interesting thing about this structuring process when a man sees the world around him according to vico that man actually perceives the superimposed shape of his own mind and entities can only be meaningful to that man if they find a place within that shape however a full fledged discussion on vico might perplex a beginner so we will start our discussion with the father of modern linguistics that is saussure now i want to keep this video concept oriented and i will not waste your time by discussing the biographical details of saussure you can find that in every other discussion but in case you still cannot find it here's everything you need to know about his life you can pause the video and take screenshots okay let's come back to our discussion in order to understand saussure's model we will conduct a brief historical survey of the science system itself 
But before we do that, we have to understand what a sign is. In the definition given by C.S. Peirce, a sign is something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. It can take any perceptible form such as a word, sound, image, action, event, order, flavor or object. This is the classical model of the sign. Both Aristotle in the Hellenic period and the Stoic philosophers in the Hellenistic period created variants of this model. Now notice that in this model, the sign vehicle generates a sense in the mind of the interpreter and ultimately the object or the referent is conveyed. So this is a representational model because we understand the referent by associating it with a concept or a sense which basically serves as the mental representation of that referent. In the medieval period, theologian and philosopher St. Augustine, the bishop of Hippo, came up with his referential model of the sign. In this model, the sign vehicle or sigma directly stands for the race or the unchanging essence of things. However, in the 20th century, finally we get Sasur. Now there is a genuine reason why this man is considered by many to be the father of modern linguistics. His model of the sign is a radical departure from all the earlier versions because Sasur kicked reality out of the equation. Yes. You heard it right. In his model of the sign, there is no place for the actual object or the referent. However, the notion that a word does not refer to an external reality but to an idea in our mind was not a new thing. We can find it in John Locke's essay concerning human understanding. But Sasur went a few steps ahead. For him, language is a differential system and in language we can find only differences. I will explain it in detail after we complete our discussion on the signifier and the signified and their internal relationship. Now Sarsour's model of the sign is not a referential one like Augustine's Signares model. It also does not resemble the classical model which is primarily representational and also involves the referent. The problem with a referential model is that it assumes that meaning resides in actual objects as if the referent is the container of meaning. But what most of us fail to realize is that we do not have an unmediated, unfiltered, direct access to things in themselves. In the Sasurian model of the sign, we will find out how we have appropriated our real world through our language. As Daniel Chandler has pointed out in his book Semiotics, that we dwell in a symbolic world of human meanings. Our everyday reality is a web of signs and our culture, our communication, our community and even our cognition depend upon these signs. As I have already mentioned, the Sarsurian model of the sign is a psychological model. Even though Sarsur was a linguist himself, he subordinated linguistics to what he called semiology. Now what is this semiology? Semiology in Sasur's own definition is a science that studies the life of science within society. Now because semiology is the general science for all kinds of science, it naturally incorporates linguistics which is the science of verbal science. Now semiology itself is part of social psychology which is in turn part of general psychology. 
However, in today's world, we do not use the term semiology. In place of this term semiology, we use the term semiotics. Now, this term semiotics was coined by John Locke in his essay concerning human understanding. And this term was popularized by C.S. Peirce. Sassur's model of the sign is a dyadic model. It has two parts, the sound image and the concept. The sound image, he called it the signifier. The concept, he named it the signified. The signifier, as I have already mentioned, is not the material sound, but the psychological imprint of that sound. It is the impression that the sound leaves on our senses. So, in the case of my previous example of the sign pen, the signifier would be the mental representation of this perceptible pattern of sound, pen. The signified, on the other hand, is the concept. Do not ever think of the signified as a mental picture. The signified, again, is not the sense or meaning. So, in the case of my previous example of the sign pen, the signified would be the relational concept of an instrument of writing. And it is through this concept of a pen, we have appropriated the real pen. Now, let me explain why you cannot use the post-Sasurian terminology to explain the Sasurian model. In the code, Sasur had famously said that language is a form and not a substance. So, if you are calling the material sound the signifier, what you are basically doing is that you are adding materiality or substance to his linguistic model. And this act, of course, goes against his premise. The signifier is tied to the signified by an associative link in our mind. They are completely interdependent and therefore cannot be separated from each other. We can only distinguish between them for the sake of our analysis. Sasur compared this signifier signified pair with the two sides of a sheet of paper. Let me, now let me illustrate this. This side of the paper, we will call it the signifier and this other side the signified. Now we cannot actually cut the front without cutting the back. Right? The signifier and the signified share a bidirectional relationship as these two arrows suggest in this diagram. They exist in a symbiotic relationship within a relational system. Neither of them precedes the other. And here comes another common misconception. You must have heard these lines multiple times that the signifier leads to the signified. The signifier triggers the signified. The signifier conjures up the signified. Now these statements make it sound like there exists a cause-effect relationship between the signifier and the signified. But all these statements are absolutely wrong. Because the dimension of time does not exist in Sassur's linguistic model of the sign. So tell me, how can causality exist without the passage of time? So that is it for this video. In the next one, we will talk about linguistic value, arbitrariness and the relational nature of language along with some of the binary oppositions like long and parole, synchronic and diachronic approach, syntagmatic and associative relations. Till then, just keep one thing in your mind. Next time you see a YouTube video with a thumbnail that looks like your five-year-old niece has done some doodles on the screen, please stay away from it.